Right, this video is going to cover off the 10 day heat block of training that I did at home, do it yourself style, mostly in my garden shed. I obviously, as ever, had elaborate plans to film each day, capture all the data and present it all in uh, a somewhat useful way. However, effectively, there's just way too much admin involved in heat training uh, to then complicate it with cameras, microphones, and capturing everything, particularly all by myself. One, one main challenge I found, and uh, we are already saying RIP, is to my Apple TV remote. We almost lost my laptop in the process of doing heat training, and one of the other concerns was potentially ruining my uh, sort of GoPro and microphone equipment, particularly the microphone, etc., as it was uh, it's relatively new. So that also was a consideration once I was training and in conditions where there was extreme sweat, extreme heat, and everything else. That said, I've just reviewed a lot of the footage that I took, and there's actually more than I remembered taking. So. I'm hoping this video won't be too much of me sat here waffling on and there'll be lots of snippets and clips and me actually talking in somewhat real time about my experience. So first thing to do is answer a few questions I got whilst I was doing the heat prep. Why are you doing this in August? Um, which is a valid question, but um, there's also a valid answer. And the very simple answer to this is I wanted to practice doing a heat prep block. So the science suggests that you need about two weeks, depending on the frequency of how often you do your sessions, to get some adaptation um, from a heat prep block. Therefore, doing it two weeks out from your event, um, particularly if you're going to then travel to the event and spend some time in those conditions. So therefore like do two weeks, fly out to said race and have a week or so in the conditions would suffice in providing you some heat adaptation and uh, give you the gains that you're looking for. Because I, at the time of doing it, was unsure as to whether I was gonna A, go to Hawaii at what point before the race, and B, I also had some options to potentially go to more exotic locations and train in conditions rather than replicate them at home, I hadn't made that decision yet. So for me, this was about, can I do it at home and can I do it to a level that would see me gain some adaptation without potentially the expense? Or in reality, for me, it was more that I wanted to stay at home preferably. I wanted to stay at home with Amy and the dog and I wanted to then have more time post Kona being away on holiday rather than using up sort of annual leave and whatnot to, to go somewhere pre-racing. So that was one decision I needed to make. The other one was then I need to practice and actually go through a protocol. Now it's worth mentioning here that I didn't make this up myself and I am being guided through this uh, by my coach. So um, we devised a list of equipment I need, how he's gonna set stuff up, and then a sort of protocol that I would follow for my sessions. So I'm very fortunate um, that I have my garden shed, which is where we do a lot of our cycling in anyway. And I was able to then put an greenhouse tent inside the shed with a humidifier, with a heater, zip it all up and get it to the right temperatures and use that to ride in. As you'll see in some of the footage, for over that 10 days, it took me between three to four sessions before I actually nailed getting my core temperature up at the times I wanted to and say those durations, how hot I needed to get the tent to start the sessions, um, how much to drink, going through the process of weighing both myself and the fluid and going through the admin process of all of that. There also was a fair amount post session where I was filling in a spreadsheet that my coach was looking at. Uh, as well as uh, sort of uploading the right files to training peaks and, and all those sort of good things. So there's a fair amount to it and I wanted to make sure that I did it correctly. I know what to do and learn some lessons and we certainly did that. And then lastly, although this wasn't necessarily a key consideration, is just like altitude training, heat prep is another stimulus you can use to gain fitness or uh, to provide yourself a different stimulus in training. Um, just because you, obviously, if you're racing in hot conditions, you might want to do some heat prep. But even if you're not necessarily going to race in super hot conditions, you may consider doing heat prep or a heat block to add another stimulus to your training. 
So all of these were advantages. The only disadvantage was trying to do this in and around kind of working in the evenings at lunch times and sort of that additional admin, if you like, rather than if you were to go somewhere, you obviously live and breathe in the heat, train in the heat, and you don't have to, you know, manually and manually uh, set that up. That said, the disadvantage to going away, and we did have this in Texas earlier this year, it can not be as hot as you expect it to be or the conditions you can never necessarily always depend on the weather particularly if you want to get this right the worst case scenario would be to go somewhere pay all that money travel and then you don't actually get any heat or the correct level of stimulus if you like so that was why we did it right it's saturday the 10th of august and today marks the start of a 10-day heat block session. The plan for the next 10 days is to effectively introduce some uh, heat sessions to try and uh, work on both the adaptation that you can get from having your core temperature slightly elevated when exercising and also the perception of the heat that I'm feeling, uh, whether I'm feeling hot, etc. So on Wednesday this week, I had a bit of a, a test session, basically one hour pedaling in the heat and uh, seeing how hot I could get, making sure my setup was all good and the temperatures I could get to were great. I didn't film anything, obviously. The, the first 30 minutes I was really hot, but I was feeling really hot and my core temperature didn't really move. And for the most part, for the first 50 minutes, it stayed below 37, um, despite the conditions I was in and the amount I was sweating being like really high, etc. So um, I ended up after 30 minutes opening up the tent and making it a bit cooler for me. And the, my core temperature continued to rise and eventually did get to where we want it to be. And I spent about 25 minutes at the desired sort of zone. But yeah, my perception is a really good demonstration of how my perception was bloody how I am hot when actually my core temperature was, was pretty good. I also learned that you have to dry your bike shoes out. <laughs> um, <laughs> I could wring my socks out and my shoes were soaking wet. So uh, another pair of bike shoes or having a, uh, them in the airing cupboard for the night uh, if you want to ride the next day is really important. Uh, and I also probably didn't quite drink enough. I took two 750 ml bottles of with me. I drank both of them. A few minor things ironed out and today is session one. I'm really keen to not lose the quality of my training. So it's now 10 past five in the evening on a Saturday. And I don't normally train this late on a Saturday. And that's because I've already done five and a half hours today. I did a four hour ride in the shed normally. And then I did a 90 minute brick run uh, which I covered about 20k. So pretty big day so far. Um, and this is very much, I'm hoping gonna be like an easy spin effort wise, just about having my core temperature elevated by a degree, possibly even higher, uh, sit and watch something on the TV and then have, have that adaptation for hopefully at least 45 minutes of the hour. So that's the plan. Uh, I'm gonna take the GoPro in and see how it goes. Let's go. Uh, I'll run you through the stuff I'm doing pre and post so we, so you can see that. Right, the next thing I have to do is weigh my bottles. And I take a photo basically of the scales because there's no way I'm going to remember exactly what the weight was. So take a photo and then I'll weigh it afterwards and then subtract each other. And that will show me how much fluid I've drunk and removes the weight of the bottles. The next step is to have to weigh myself and I need to remove clothing. So just the top half, don't worry. I don't get too excited, all the middle-aged women that follow me. Right, let's weigh in. Okay, weighing in at, does it tell me it was 70.3, which is quite light on those scales for me. I reckon I'm about 68, 69 kilos. And those scales normally have me at 71-ish. But as I say, five hour plus session already today, undoubtedly have lost some weight. Now let's go get hot. <sighs> it does feel really weird to have this kind of set up <laughs> in your own home or shed. Um, yeah, All right. So I've currently got Zwift the other side of this. I've pressed start, so it's just waiting for me to start pedaling. Kept the... Uh, the Apple TV remote in here, so I can still control that. 
get my favourite YouTube things on. Garmin to record the session so that it has the core temperature sensor connected to it. So effectively this is the file that I'll put on Training Peak so that coach can see all the data as you can't connect the core sensor to Zwift or not to my knowledge you can't. Okay, 15 minutes in for about 0.6 higher, which isn't quite enough. I did do five minutes quite a bit harder and it's definitely got it moving, but I just feel so hot, as you can probably tell. I know if I stick at this, the number's moving now in, what is it, hundreds pretty quickly, 0 0.56, 0 0.57, so I'm say. Oh man, this is a stupid sport. Stupid, stupid sport. 25 minutes in. We've just hit the one degree increase from starting temp. This is so tough. I don't remember it being this hard. I've been a bit of a pussy. I've had to open the tent up, but it is set, it's over 40 degrees in here, so. Okay, things are settling down a bit. I must remember that. We're now in the official zone four of core temp. I've adopted the setup slightly. I became less of a pussy and did the temp back up. But I have got the fan. And uh, that is making the difference. I think even in this small space, some air moving. Um, we did have the fans on when I did it in the lab, so. Holy crap, this is tough. I hope it's worth it. <laughs> just gone over the hour mark now. I'm just gonna pedal it out to 65, so I get that 45 minutes. Doesn't seem like much, but obviously this is a lot of hassle. You miss five minutes over 10 sessions, that's 50 minutes. That's basically a whole session. I'd rather sit here at while the temperature's high. It's actually all right, the last 20 minutes have been fine. Even though the core temperature is hot, it's not like hot thermal sensation. I'm almost like the opposite to what you might expect. Whew. Anyway, let's weigh in. So just weighed in. This could be the first time ever. I've put weight on. So we're up 0.1 of a kilo, which suggests I drank enough. Now, guesstimations, two 750s and most of a litre, so two-ish, 2.2 .2 litres maybe. We'll see when I do the maths, but that's good. And look, I've kept, kept the core sensor on while we, and it's still 38.78, it topped out at 38.8. So in theory, I'm still in the zone. Just this is how long it takes for your core temperature to come down. <sighs> right, let's have a bath. Not a hot one, and I mean a shower. Who has a bath? It's not a Sunday. Right. I think this is Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Day five of heat adaptation training. Today is the fourth ride. Fourth one hour, or just over an hour ride, getting nice and hot. And despite some pretty honest feedback of uh, how I think it's been going, my coach has said, you need to suffer more. So dig out your waterproof jacket, get hotter at the start and try and keep more body heat in and then continue to suffer. Which, um, yeah, I'm obviously really excited for and uh, really glad I started this process and uh, yeah, really enjoying it. Not. Anyway, we get it done because something I've been telling myself, whether it's true or not, is not everyone is going to be willing to do this type of work. And I am not the most talented athlete, never have been, never will be. But even in work life, I have proven time and time again to myself that I am someone who will work harder than the average person. So that's what I'm doing. I'm working harder and trying to 
maximize this training. Someone's already been warming the shed up for me. Hello. It's you. <laughs> I got a rain jacket on. Why? Apparently I don't suffer enough. Oh. Right, it is the penultimate day of heat training. However, it's my last day on the bike. Tomorrow's is a run followed by a hot bath. So, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> we get this session done and then I think I'm gonna have to go through some of the highs and lows, things I've learned. So let's get this session done. It's lunchtime on a Monday. It means I can pretty much have the evening off, just a little bit of S&C later. The suffering in this and the smell, the smell in there. <laughs> I don't even wanna try and emulate it. It stinks. <laughs> So now that this is session number seven on the bike, I have changed my setup a little bit and optimized it a bit in terms of productivity, but also some equipment. The first is I'm on my Cube cross bike, which I'll show you in a minute. Partly because my TT bike and my road bike can't go on my turbo at the moment. I've had some mechanical issues, but actually it's probably the better bike to sweat all over and not damage the bearings of as much, or they're not as expensive to replace. Uh, and it's a little bit comfier than the TT bike and or road bike. So that's a positive. I've got to the point now where I can get the tent up 42, 43, which is very hot. And if I do 15 to 20 minutes at that temperature with it all zipped up, my core temperature gets up high enough that for the rest of the session, I can have the fan on and I can even open the zip uh, to the front. I can watch the TV and the shed stays about 38 to 39 degrees. So I've been targeting 36 to 40, so it sits in that bracket, and my core temperature will continue to rise. And it's almost not as unpleasant as what I was doing in the earlier sessions, which is trying to stay in there fully zipped up the whole time, having to turn the heaters on and off. And so yeah, I think I've nailed it now. This is gonna be session number three, where I'm gonna keep the same uh, timings of things, and uh, hopefully it still works. The other is, my laptop needs its own fan because it gets so hot in here it fries the laptop battery so that needs a fan on while we're zwifting just to keep the laptop cool and i have to prop it up off the wood so airflow can go underneath it because it gets so damn hot okay so a little bit of a rundown of did the heat training work um i have pulled up some graphs and put some of the data in to have a look at how we think it played out one thing I can definitely notice, not only just from a observation type point of view, but the data definitely suggests uh, and points towards is that my sweat rate did increase. So I think I mentioned in the day one, I actually managed to gain a small bit of weight, um, you know, albeit there might be some uh, discrepancy in the scale slightly, but effectively I think I gained like 0.1 of a kilo uh, post session. And by the end of the uh, sessions, I was losing closer to like half a kilo, which is all within a, a pretty good range in terms of I was still drinking quite a lot, but effectively I drank the same amount in all my sessions, but we started to see a, lo a lot more sweat loss effectively. And sweating is a good thing. Sweating is something that your body is doing to cool yourself down. I have noticed in the two or three weeks after, particularly when riding indoors, I'm still sweating more than I used to or have done previously. So yeah, have retained some of that uh, functionality, if you like, or keeping myself a bit cooler. We saw my power increase. Now the protocol was all about getting your core temperature up and trying to do 45 minutes plus at, that, at the desired temperature and then effectively just soft pedaling. There wasn't any power targets from my coach or, or anything like that. But what I did see over time, yes, I was thinking about it a little bit. I could see Zwift and what have you, but I certainly wasn't like, I'm going to ride at X power today. But we saw naturally my power go from like low 140s, 150s average for a session up to sort of 180, 170 per session. And the heart rates be very similar, but the power values 
uh, went up and they were pretty steady. You know, there wasn't, I didn't do any intervals. I didn't do any different sessions as such. So that's a relative positive that clearly for the same temperature and in some case, even a hotter conditions, the power had gone up and the heart rate had either come down or, or remain stable. That is a sign that you're coping better with said conditions. And the couple of baths I did, the they got easier as I did them. The first one was really hard. I really did underestimate how hard a hot bath was. I couldn't keep myself submerged for the full 20 minutes without having mini breaks or moving around. Uh, and by the last bath, we added two minutes per one. I did a 24 minute bath and I pretty much stayed submerged. The water was the exact same temperature, 40 degrees as it was in the first one. And I felt relatively comfortable. I lost the same amount of body weight over the bath sessions in terms of we measured my body weight before and after. They were coming down by like multiple kilos. So just over two kilos a session in the bath. Um, I wasn't allowed to drink in the bath unlike when I was on the bike. Um, so yeah, you certainly saw a, bit, a big drop in weight. But in terms of thermal comfort, it actually got better and I didn't feel as hot. And then lastly, some of the lessons I learned in terms of things I'll definitely start out with next time. So as I mentioned, uh, one, of the, one of the clips by kind of session five or six, I'd figured out how hot I needed to get the tent and then how hot it would stay. And I could allow myself to have a bit of moving air and have the tent slightly unzipped, etc., and didn't necessarily have to punish myself but it was more that I actually didn't have to get on and off the bike to keep turning the heaters on and on and off to kind of try and regulate the temperatures as, as such that might be different come October because some of the contributing factors to that will have been the outdoor temperature and how hot the shed can stay without heat being added to it but that's certainly something that I'll look at and try to try to mimic uh, come October so that a I don't have to get on and off the bike and b it was a bit more pleasant albeit hopefully some of that pleasantness was because I became more adapted to the conditions the next is to have as few electronic devices in proximity as possible as i say i've broken an apple tv remote i'm pretty sure from sweating on it so that definitely needs to either be wrapped in clingfield after i've replaced it my laptop suffered quite a lot it is a very old laptop that i run swift on but that gets really hot and a few times froze and i was just dependent on my bike computer um, which isn't the end of the world but i obviously don't want my laptop to die uh, i want to use it for swift um, so electronics is a key thing and probably protecting my phone a bit more when it's in the tent with me is something I need to do. The next is my bike. Um, so I um, will just use my cross bike from the start. I'd recommend this. Uh, my headset bearings are already pretty trashed in my TT bike and are due to be uh, replaced uh, later this month by Harper and Cycles. I certainly don't want to get my new headset bearings in and then sweat all, all manner of salt over it and screw them up again. Um, so I won't be using my TT bike for the heat sessions and using a bike which you yeah, care less about, or as I say, it's not as expensive to maintain, I would thoroughly recommend. The last thing is the smell um, and the amount of towels and laundry you'll go through. Um, so I uh, definitely need to get better at cleaning up post sessions. I think Amy went in there to do one of her sessions and and get the remote out of it and stuff. And she, she's got a much more sensitive sense of smell to me, but I, even I could smell it, which suggested that the conditions were pretty grim. So I need to be better at cleaning up and disinfecting. I obviously clean the towels and all that sort of stuff after every session, but yeah, we must have done an extra couple of loads of laundry in those 10 days from the two or three towels I was using, the, the kit, uh, obviously I don't reuse my cycling kit every turbo session, but you could wring them out. You can see from me wringing my socks out how much sweat there was in the items of clothing. Um, and you continue to sweat. So, you know, when I did the odd lunchtime session, I would continue to sweat, particularly after a hot bath for the rest of the afternoon or for at least a couple of hours. So you go for a few more t-shirts that day as well. Um, just so, you know, uh, to, to kind of, uh, uh, keep yourself sort of, cool etc okay so that concludes the video wraps it up hopefully that's somewhat useful hopefully it's interesting even if you're not doing heat prep yourself i imagine some of you watching this might be going to kona or will do in the future and do your own heat prep for me it's definitely possible and i'm definitely going to go with that approach leading into kona of doing a solid 10 day block before i go out to the race 
Um, but yeah, there's some considerations and sort of things you need to think about. And I would thoroughly suggest, even if it's a test session, you don't need to do a, a test 10 day block maybe, but do a test session to make sure you've got all the equipment and you can get things hot enough uh, and whatnot so that you're ready to go. Thanks for watching. And uh, yeah, if you enjoyed the video, you know what to do. Like it.